I'm Mike Adams and this is Steve Cushman. Steve is president of the CHRS, California Historical Radio Society. We're here in one of our many museum rooms at KRE in Berkeley and we want to take you back at a time when radio collecting was just starting 25, 30 years ago. It's uh, Mike Adams, and you'll notice Mike before he had this color hair, and uh, Mike did a series for PBS called The Radio Collector. It was very popular, it's been in hiatus for many years, but we're putting it on YouTube for you to see and enjoy today. Thanks to CHRS, thank you. Hello, my name is Mike Adams, and I collect and restore old radios, radios from the 1920s, 1930s, and 1940s. I do it as a hobby. It's an enjoyable hobby, and for a long time, I've wanted to do a series of television programs on collecting and restoring old radios. The rarest piece in my collection, this is a 1915 Kilborn and Clark. First, meet the people who collect old radios. Over the next five weeks, you'll watch dozens of collectors show hundreds of radios. Well, these are in great demand by collectors. They're called the breadboard, the uh, Atwater Kent breadboard. I learned that many collectors specialize in a particular era or brand of antique radio device. This is a, uh, the Horn Speaker Museum in uh, a room over my garage. It uh, represents a collection of radio horn speakers uh, from the 1922 to the 1927 era. You'll see powerful 12-tube radios in beautiful wood cabinets. 1938 radios, that's when Zenith made their best radios and they made the most radios. In other words, we were coming out of a depression and they knew that there was going to be a lot of radios sold and they really made some good radios. And rare 1930s Art Deco radios. Beauty. And final act of the And the Beast. How are you, Mike? Glad to see you here. Later in this series, a stop at the Pacific Pioneer Broadcasters for a behind-the-scenes look at the golden age of radio. You'll spend time at a retail store that sells old radios and meet Jack Dempsey, the old radio collector. And I'll take you to a swap meet with the Southern California Antique Radio Society and talk with some longtime collectors. We didn't have big flea markets like this 20 years ago. But uh, there was a lot of activity, and the stuff was very reasonable. You could buy radios for $5, and you go to the dump and get them for 50 cents, but those days are gone now. Each week, a continuing look at restoration of radios made between 1928 and 1942. Bruce Westaby is our expert. And it's getting to the point now that a set on legs, you know, made prior to 1934, they stand about a 50% chance of being restored without taking from another set. Later, in this half hour, a brief look at the inventions that led to wireless communication in the early part of this century, and learn how radio became an important part of family life in the 1920s. But first, I want to find an old junk radio and start the restoration part of this series. You can still find these at the neighborhood thrift shops. Here's an RCA Victor Cathedral. Do you ever know how old it is or what, uh, what age it is? I think it's from the 1920s. Yeah. Uh, it's not working. It needs one part. Yeah, how much? Uh, get it going. I want about $75 for it. Wow. The cord is all frayed out, so yeah, I wouldn't want to. it wouldn't be a good idea to plug it in now. No, that's amazing. Probably uh, they started using those tubes in the late 40s. Well, this is an old Atwater can from a 1920s floor model. The metal cabinet, uh, 
It's enameled. Does it work? Uh, it needs three tubes. It looks yeah. like a uh, 1949 Oldsmobile. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think a Studebaker. Studebaker, yeah. It's nice, and it's from the 40s, because you can tell by the type of tubes it uses. Does it work? I really have never plugged yeah. this one in. I don't know. I don't have any idea. Yeah. How much would you sell it for? I gotta get 25 for that. Yeah. Hmm. Really, it probably yeah, it probably works. Although I wanted something I could do woodwork on, and something I could. Do you have something that's totally beat up, like an old console that needs woodwork, that doesn't work, that has? Well, how about this one back here, then? Can we dig this, this out here. Well, let's take it outside where you can see it in the light. It's definitely a candidate for restoration, um, but it's all here, though. That's what I like about it. It's all here, and uh, we'll we'll consider this to be the before, okay, the before shot. Cool. Yeah, the classic. Uh, yeah, we're going to put it in here. It's a classic uh, silver tone. Over the next few weeks, uh, you can follow the restoration of this 1930 Sears radio that I found uh, in a Hollywood junk shop. I will show you throughout the program the replacement of uh, some of these parts. And well, these are really in horrible shape. And by the end of the program, we will replace a lot of these capacitors and resistors and maybe a couple of tubes. And we'll have a working radio. But let us, first of all, take our cabinet, and you saw what it looked like when we found it there at the junk store. We'll, we'll take our cabinet to Bruce Westaby, a radio restoration expert. Stripping, and then the woodwork comes first. And then after that, uh, the set has to be sanded every square inch, or steel wool, whatever, whatever, however the set's made. And then the wood has to be prepared, and then the hand blacking done and then it gets spray tinted and then the clear put on. Part of the framework here that I can glue and, and put new uh, what they call cross banding in here and, uh, and the veneer on it. This all had to come off this, but this is wood. It's not, uh, oh, some of the things were like a pressed, a pressed Sirocco it was called. It oh was, yeah, like plaster or? Very close. Yeah. And you, you have to take those off real careful or they shatter. Mm. And uh, as far as the face goes, that's no problem. I brought a couple little ones uh, so you can see how it looks like. Uh, as far as the top goes, I can see the cross bending lifting al along the edge. So that's no problem. I take a hypodermic needle with a, some glue and glue along in there with a, or a butter knife and mm -hmm. clamp it down. And it needs to be re-veneered. Um, I can use strips of old veneer or I can buy veneer that you iron on. And the only thing is with iron-on veneer is that uh, uh, you just have to be real careful and make sure it's all nice and warm so that it won't bubble. Um, but it generally works real well. This is black walnut, this is black walnut, and this is like a, a regular walnut that you see quite a bit in most of the sets. And on the sides of the set, down towards the bottom, this one's not bad at all, but a lot of times they have great big chunks out of them. Uh, where people have picked them up and then broken the chunks out. Mm -hmm. What's one thing I notice about, about restored sets is that the, the grill cloth always looks so new. It doesn't have that yellowed, uh, cigarette smoked on kind of appearance that you expect. Uh, I don't know, how do you, what, what do you use for grill cloth? Because you can't buy it anymore like this, can you? This is no, like no. Um, I use drapery material mm -hmm. and I'll look around until I find something that's suitable. And if it's too gold or too white, I take and tint it with a, uh, with a spray sting. Oh, okay. And that mutes it down oh, a little bit and ma makes it look really nice. Because uh, nothing's worse than to get something all put together than have a grill cloth in there that with big chrome bars in it or something, you know? Our weekly restoration project is a late 20s electric radio in a wood cabinet, common from 1927 to the present. But radio doesn't start here. It begins 50 years earlier. It's the late 1800s, a world without radio, television, or talking pictures. Early electrical experimenters are trying to understand the sending and receiving of radio waves through space and without wires. Author and historian Morgan McMahon begins our story. It goes way back to 1865 to a gentleman named James Clerk Maxwell. He developed a theory 
of electromagnetic waves that predicted that one could propagate radio waves through space. His work laid a little dormant until 1887, when a gentleman named Heinrich Hertz first decided to test the theory. He sent electromagnetic waves, that is radio waves, across a room from a crude spark gap to a circle of wire that indeed had a small spark appear. Radio was not really harnessed until 1895 when a gentleman named Guglielmo Marconi transmitted radio messages. By 1899, he had set up commercial transmission from ships to shore, which was the major use of radio, or what it was called wireless in those days. The ship called the SS Republic was plowing through fog-covered waters off Nantucket Island uh, in the early uh, 1900s, was rammed by another ship and began sinking. A gentleman named Jack Binns was the radio operator on that ship. He sent out what was called a CQD, a distress single, signal, which then was picked up by people on shore who dispatched ships to pick up the survivors. Only six people were lost in that accident and the world applauded the maturing of radio. Because of the early experimenters, the world was slowly learning to use wireless. In 1900, the primary commercial user of this new communications medium was the shipping industry. But early wireless was not radio broadcasting as we know it. It wasn't even called radio. Furthermore, it wasn't even the transmission of the human voice. That comes years later. Instead, wireless was the sending of Morse code dots and dashes, caused by turning a spark gap on and off with a telegraph key. My father was a pioneer in, uh, in radio. Uh, he was demonstrating wireless at the Nebraska State Fair in 1906. He had a, a spark transmitter, and uh, he used a spark coil, and the receiver was a glass tube in which were nickel and iron filings and as a radio signal would come through, the uh, filings would cohere, as they called it, and uh, change the resistance of the circuit and operate a relay and ring a bell. So that when you uh, pushed a button on one side of the room and sent a signal and uh, the bell rang on the other side of the room, you had actually been broadcasting by radio. In those days, they called it wireless. You can see that little spark there. This is an early transmitter. This was built in about 1915, um, that era. This is a coil, and uh, it made a spark across here. And you hooked an antenna onto it like you did the other. And then there was a, a, uh, a, a transfer switch here. You would transmit with this switch in the one position and throw the switch over to receive in the other. And uh, this part over here is the receiver. It consists of a coil of wire with two sliders on it. This is a fixed condenser. And then here is the crystal detector. This little piece of galena could be purchased at the lo local dime store for between 15 cents and maybe 25 cents if you wanted to get a real big piece of galena. And uh, you would wind a coil and tune the coil to the frequency of a broadcast station that was near you and using headphones uh, and a, a long wire antenna, usually you had to have 100 feet of wire outside and this would be connected to a water pipe ground. And then uh, you would sit down on a quiet evening and uh, turn this tap, which would uh, turn in more or less number of turns of wire. And then you would start to fiddle around with this little wire, which was called a cat whisker and find a place on the Galena crystal where you could hear audio. To hear any radio signal, you need a detector, a device that changes high-frequency radio waves into audio. But how does the detector know which station the listener wants? As the number of transmitters multiplied, better methods of separating stations by frequency were needed. This is called tuning. There were a great many experimenters in the period, the early teens, 
And um, the most popular device in that time was a loose coupler. Stations, which might be received with a loose coupler such as this, were um, damp spark transmissions. So they had a wide bandwidth, and um, exact tuning wasn't very important because the um, uh, selectivity of the circuit didn't have to be extremely sharp to um, receive the wideband signal, such as a damp spark. The um, detectors used with these loose couplers, an experimenter might use a crystal detector, or he might have used a vacuum tube detector if he had the money to afford one. Throughout the pre-World War I period, advances in coil winding meant better coils, which improved both the sensitivity and selectivity of radio. World War I research was um, very active and uh, sets quickly became more sophisticated and um, actually a lot more electrically mechanically complex. Still, radio as we know it had not yet happened. Yes, wireless had improved and was now used as a serious communication tool. Certainly, the sending and receiving of messages had come a long way since the turn of the century. Still, wireless communication was mostly spark or continuous wave sending of dots and dashes. And more people were sending and receiving messages over greater distances with greater reliability. Meanwhile, throughout the teens, a series of technical advances would finally allow quality transmission of voice and music. The real breakthrough that would put a radio in every home was right around the corner. The story of radio really hinges on the vacuum tube, first conceived by Thomas Edison, who found that one could emit electrons from a heated filament. A gentleman named J. Ambrose Fleming later developed what is called the vacuum tube diode. Uh, after this, of course, De Forest was really the one with the impact who came up with a tube called a triode in which you could make small signals big. This was the start of the real radio revolution. Slowly, in part due to its high cost, the vacuum tube replaced the crystal as a detector and made possible the amplification of earphone level signals to loudspeaker volumes. The tube made high quality voice transmission a reality. While experimenters labored to improve the tube, business people and their lawyers were battling out ownership issues. As late as 1921, the RCA tubes UV200 and 201 were the only legal tubes sold. These samples by DeForest, Sodion, Davin, Western Electric, and Arcturus were manufactured throughout the 1920s. The vacuum tube really brought voice transmission to the quality that one could use in broadcast. A gentleman named Dr. Frank Conrad in 1919 decided to set up a small transmitter in Pittsburgh. He was the start of true broadcasting, although people like Fessenden uh, actually broadcast earlier. The problem was there was no audience, no audience, no broadcast really. Radio arrives. With KDKA in Pittsburgh, the broadcasting era officially begins, and almost overnight, everyone will want to listen to radio for information and entertainment. When I was a young, young kid, uh, uh, I used to build radios for the neighbors, and uh, this was way back in the uh, early 20s when radios first started. I used to build uh, one-tube radios and two- and three-tube radios and uh, crystal sets, and this was the common uh, thing that was done in the early, early days of... Uh, of radio. Uh, people would make their own or they'd have somebody else make them for them and uh, it was a challenge to get a radio that uh, all put together and get it to work and, and tune in all the distant stations and people would stay up real late at night. The neighborhood radio expert was pretty important and almost every boy built a crystal set from a kit, perhaps for a Boy Scout merit badge. This is one of the first RCA uh, radiolas and it's called a Radiola 2 and you had to use earphones with it because it wasn't powerful enough just being two tubes. So what they did later on, they, people wanted loudspeakers. So what they did was they made a little device called a 
a balanced amplifier, and that was that just connected to the little radiola three. Now we made a four tube radio out of it, and the radio would look like this. They were connected together, and you'd have four tubes, and you could run a loudspeaker with this. This is an Atwater Kent uh, breadboard radio. Atwater Kent sold component parts, pieces like this here, and the other d different types of parts that went on a board. Uh, he sold these things uh, to people that want to make their own radios. The uniqueness of it is this, that this is the only tuning you have. One tuning device, and it just tunes the antenna. All of the rest of it over here is, is the radio frequency tubes, the detectors, and the amplifiers. There's no tuning in this section of the radio, like the ones that they were made later on, or even at, at the same time this was made. They did have radios that you could tune the different uh, uh, stages. But in this case, you only tuned one. So now, when this radio runs, you get a lot of stations all at one time, because you cannot separate them. It's not sensitive enough to separate stations. The typical household would have at least one radio, typically a, a three-dialer radio, which, by the way, was a very difficult thing to tune if you were far away from stations. Typically, the early radios required somebody who was very adept, uh, had almost a, a, a great deal of intuition, also had the guts to turn the thing on because very often if you turn the filament voltage up a little too high, you would pop the tubes. By the way, a set of tubes for a, uh, a radio would cost almost as much as, as half a week's labor would, would buy. As the tubes got better, then could take these three dials and just hitch the three dials together so that you would turn one knob and all three tuners inside the set would, would move and uh, that then was, was the beginning of the simple sets. So we have really two basic kinds of sets that people use. The TRF set, which uh, was obsoleted Im immediately as RCA let other people build the superheterodyne sets. I remember as a youngster, uh, our first radio was a battery uh, set, had a uh, set of headphones and we would, my dad would listen, and, and we kids would, he would turn one, one headphone out this way, and then our, our kids, where we kids, would, would stand around and listen to that one headphone while he heard the program in the other headphone. Yeah, it, it was a real ball, a great thing for pulling families together because you all just all had all your heads put together in, in one spot. Then the, uh, the Baldwin headphone came out uh, was was a different construction than the uh, uh, than the other type headset, and it was actually louder. It uh, it had a permanent magnet in here, and the the uh, vibrations caused this little diaphragm to move back and forth, and that was attached to this diaphragm here. And it was so loud that you could uh, you could put this headphone in a uh, a bowl and uh, put it on the dining room table and uh, the whole family could uh, sit around the table and listen to the radio. Uh, they were getting into the point, place where people d didn't want to sit around with earphones, they wanted to listen to things with loudspeakers. So they took this two-tube radio and they added another tube to it to make it so it was, you could run, run a loudspeaker and it's an amplifier. And they put it in the door, in the cover, in the back, where you, generally the batteries went in here. But to have it so they could run a speaker, they went ahead and added the third tube and put it in the door. And it has the same wiring. You can see the spaghetti here and up in here, which is identical to over here. And you notice it's got a GE uh, thing here and a GE transformer. And the tube is the same as the other tubes in there and the socket. So it's all general electric parts and they're just added to it to make a three tube radio so you could listen to it with a loudspeaker. After Conrad's transmissions and KDKA, there was an explosion in the radio broadcast field. It was very difficult for the radio listeners because the radios operated from batteries. Before everybody had a battery charger, you had to take your storage battery, 
down to the local garage and, and have it charged. And most people had two storage batteries. They had one that they would use, and then they had the other one that they would be down at the garage being charged. So that was a, a weekly chore for somebody to take the battery down and get it charged so you could run the radio the next week. These batteries, incidentally, are just a little outdated. They have a date of them, May 1926. In 1927, the true breakthrough occurred, and that was the development and production of alternating current radios that could plug right into the wall of the house. This really sprang radio loose. It also was the turning point in which radios changed from little scientific looking toys, uh, very strange things with, with three dials almost like a, a three-dial safe to something which had easy use, uh, didn't have Sonny running down the street to get batteries charged, didn't have the continued expense of buying B batteries uh, every several weeks, and also marked the turning point where one could really call radio a furniture and very elegant radio sets, the large consoles that we all remember, were made built, produced by the millions. Here's what happened to the radio between 1925 and 1927, from storage battery to household electric power, from three dial tuning to single dial, earphones to loudspeakers. In just a few years, the radio evolved from a two-way telegraphic communications device, an experimenter's hobby, into a family entertainment medium called broadcasting. And in a couple of weeks, I'll take you behind the scenes and let you see what a typical broadcast station looked like in the 1930s. Also in future weeks, the role of the amateur radio operator in the development of radio technology. Don Wallace was there at the beginning. As a boy in high school, I was interested in radio, of course, 1910, <coughs> and I became a high school student 1912, and uh, of course the radio laws came in, and uh, neighbor Ham told me I ought to get a license, so I did. The uh, license was uh, nice and easy. He said, get a slip of paper and write, I can send and receive five words a minute. Take it down to my dad's bank and have it notarized. And uh, so I had the notary down there stamp it, mailed it in, that was my examination. Next week, I'll continue restoration on our $35 thrift shop radio, a 1929 Silvertone. Bruce Westaby will show us how he restores the chassis, the electronics of AC radios, and you'll meet three collectors of battery era radio devices. That's the late teens to the late 1920s. All that and more next week on The Radio Collector. Looks like it's going to work. still have these things around. This was the entertainment of, that people used way back before they had uh, widespread radios. This was the family entertainment.